topic of recognition in education is probably one of the most difficult topics. And it's one of the most difficult topics in this course. Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. This is eLearning 3.0. When we talk about recognition, we talk about things like assessment and credentials and grades and badges and all of that. And, you know, all of these can be parts of recognition. But I chose the term recognition to cover this part of the course because I want to say explicitly that what I think of as recognition is the same sort of thing of that I think of when I think of knowledge in general. The answer to the question, how do we know that this person is a qualified doctor, say, is the same kind of answer as the answer to the question, how do we know that this is a tiger? How do we know that this is dangerous? How do we know that that's my grandmother coming through the railway station? In short, assessment is about recognition. Assessment is about trying to figure out how we know something or another is the case. First question that comes up in recognition is, of course, the question, what exactly are we recognizing? And the most obvious answer is that we're recognizing learning success. And that leads us to want to focus on the learner, him or herself. But in the process of online learning and learning generally, we should also be looking at assessing things like the learning environment. We should be looking at assessing things like learning resources and perhaps also instructors or facilitators. We want to understand that assessment and recognition is a total package. That, you know, our understanding of whether somebody's a doctor speaks not only about that person, but also the entire educational background of that person. Second question is, what counts as success? The go-to answer for that question is something like test scores, standardized tests, whatever. But that's an answer that's inadequate. It might be easy to give people tests and take the scores, but we know that it's not very reliable in the long run. You would not trust that somebody is a qualified doctor simply because they passed a test, right? Uh, a more comprehensive approach might be that we're assessing for competencies, for example, as defined by IMS Global. That raises the question of what a competency is, how we define a specific competency, and how we assess for that. And in other words, it's pushed the question back one level. In the current course, I take a more pragmatic approach, and that approach is task completion. Was a person able to do the thing that they wanted to do successfully? That's because in informal learning, we're not trying to, you know, amass a body of knowledge about some content area, especially in today's world where that body of knowledge is completely different next week. Rather, it's about, can we use the content of this course to get something done? And through the course, what I've tried to do is give suggestions as to the sorts of things that you can get done using this course. You don't have to try to get those things done, you can get other things done. Nonetheless, uh, it creates this kind of framework for understanding uh, in this course, uh, you know, in the connectivist MOOCy sort of way. In the assessment of learning environments, we often fall back on the four level Kirkpatrick scale. And that ranges from, you know, simple satisfaction with the course to the amount of knowledge retained to whether you applied it in the workplace to whether it actually improved performance in the workplace. Some people add a fifth level um, to talk about return on investment. Did the training pay for itself, in other words? But a lot of MOOC evaluation is process oriented. A lot of course evaluation is process oriented. Did the person attend all the classes? Did the person complete the course? And 
the evaluation of instructors, meanwhile, can be everything from student grades to course evaluations to peer review to some schlocky site on the internet. Which leads to the third question. Who decides? Uh, you know, this is where the original MOOCs challenged the status quo. Uh, as, as Dave Cormier made very clear in one of his videos, what counts as success so you've just registered for your first you MOOC and you're wondering what to do next. To there are many ways you can uh, succeed in a MOOC. To me you might just want to follow along and get a sense of the topic. You might be doing it for course, course credit. You might um, be doing it to develop a new learning network time or to help that, finish that project uh, you're working on. This video is how I look at success in a massive open Some online course. Value the course Let's say you've just registered for a MOOC about thingamajigs. The you've registered at the course site and you've decided that you're going to commit uh, your time, the but you're trying to figure out or facilitated by the course or the task they were able to accomplish using the learning resource. All kinds of different things that count as success for people in a course. In a wider community, we often define who decides in terms of stakeholders. The most often, the most obvious stakeholder is the funder, which may be a government, a company, a private agency, you know, like a foundation or a church or whatever. And they'll have certain goals and certain expectations related to outcomes, which may bring us back to the Kirkpatrick scale or may bring us into an entirely different realm of assessment. Of course, participants' parents or families might have expectations as well, especially for young, younger learners. And the community as a whole is very often going to want to have a say in the need for uh, outcomes such as literacy, civics, public stewardship, standards of acceptable behavior, and more. But maybe the most important question with respect to assessment is, how do we know? This has two parts. First part is, how do we make the actual determination of success, whatever it is? Is it a public and social process? Or is it a personal and private process? Are the evaluation standards expected to be fair and objective? I used to say, you know, my preferred grading scheme is arbitrary and unfair because that's how society works. Second, how do we communicate that knowledge? You know, that's the role of the certificate or the degree or the badge or whatever. It's a, a communication role. Um, it's to somehow say that in some way we've made this determination and this person associated with this certificate or badge or whatever has demonstrated a certain degree of success somewhere. Um, individuals present these certificates in their CV or in their resume or display it with badges in a backpack or whatever or sometimes they might present artifacts as evidence of that success. For example blog posts or portfolio which is artists will use that a lot artifacts such as open source software, contributions to projects, etc. Well, we can't answer all of those questions in one module, but we can give or look at what will give us the framework for an answer. And so in this module, we looked at two major technical approaches. First, briefly, competencies and competency frameworks and second and in more detail the badge infrastructure now should be clear that from the outset neither of these is going to provide satisfactory answers to our questions neither is exactly a future technology someone pointed out during the course badge has been around since 2012 uh, competencies even longer uh, you know they're not going to be the whole story the reason why we're using these is to give us a mechanism for talking about what the answers to some of these questions is going to look like. Okay, so let's begin with competencies. Um, in recent years, we've had a renewed focus on the idea of competencies and competency definitions. Uh, according to some definitions, 
competencies are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors that contribute to, well, something. Um, and that's where a lot of these definitions vary. Uh, you know, they're pretty consistent on knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors, and some would include attitudes, I suppose. But the something in question might be individual and organizational performance, or it might be successful living and learn, sorry, successful learning, living, and working, or it might be highly effective performance within a particular job. Well, okay, that, that application of the knowledge, skills, abilities, etc. is one thing. But the terms themselves are also troublesome. Look at what the uh, NIH uh, site defines them as. Knowledge is information developed or learned through experience, study, or investigation. Well, for one thing, knowledge isn't information, but we'll leave that aside. Um, Skill is the result of repeatedly applying knowledge or ability. Really? Ability is an innate potential to perform mental and physical actions or tasks. Well, I have a lot of trouble with the idea of ability being innate because innate means built in. You have it from birth, which means you can never change your ability or something, which is you know, sheer craziness. Um, you know, telling us what, the res what skill is the result of doesn't tell us what skill is. Uh, and as you know, I've often said, knowledge is recognition, not information. And there are lots of reasons for that. Now, we're not going to solve any of these things in this video. But I want to flag these as issues that we need to look at and we need to think about when we're looking at a wider discussion of assessment and evaluation. Okay, with competencies. Uh, in the United States, the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative has launched something they call the Competencies and Skills Systems uh, Program as part of their wider total learning architecture. Now, the ADL approach is based on a mechanism for tracking uh, and recording learning activities. So there's a thing called the Experience API, XAPI, uh, that defines how these act activity records are created, what they look like, and then how they're stored in something called a learning record store for analysis and evaluation. And there's a helpful diagram of that entire process on this CMI page, and, and, and here it is, we can see it here. And we're going from the learner has a learning experience to uh, the experience is tracked by a learning rack provider, and then to uh, which creates and send records to the learning record store, and then which stores these records about the learner, and then a learning record consumer can access the learning record store to acquire learning records. And what would happen then, right, is uh, they would use those records for some sort of assessment purpose. Now, why is this significant? Well, first of all, it's kind of neutral on the whole question of what a competency is. We're just gonna talk about them as activities. And I, I think that's pretty relevant. Um, secondly, it allows different learning tools to create these records and then contribute them to the same common learning record store, which means that we're actually assessing uh, learning activities or creating learning activity records from across a bunch of different uh, software applications or environments. And third, it's something that can be used in a generic way as part of a learning analysis. Um, they have, of course, chosen the moment of my video to do vacuuming outside the office. Um, okay, now within this framework, we can work with the numerous different competency definition standards. 
And there are many of them. There are dozens, maybe hundreds of these competency definitions. Everything from Australia's national competency standards to the NIH's nursing competency standards. We have standards in our own office. You probably have standards in your office, etc. Now these vary quite a bit, but more or less comply with competencies as defined in the IMS information model. Now it's a bit of a mess. Okay, no, it's not a mess. I shouldn't call it that. But but it's complex, right? Uh, here, a competency definition is an optional structured description that provides a more complete definition of the competency or educational objective, usually using attributes taken from a specific model of how a competency or educational objective should be structured or defined. Typically, such models define a competency or educational objective in terms of statement conditions, criteria, proficiency criteria, indicators, standards, performance indicators, outcomes, abilities, basic skills, content, process, and similar sets of statements, right? So think about that. Um, there's different data coming in. Um, statements, conditions, proficiency, performance indicators, basic skills, etc. And then there's a form of assessment against some kind of standard that takes place on that data. And that's kind of the core idea of a competency. So let's move on to badges. Because a badge can be thought of as a specific token given to a person in recognition of the satisfaction of the proof as specified in a competency definition. Now, let me be clear here, right? Uh, we say can be because in practice, as in this course, uh, badges are often a lot less rigorously defined. But you get the idea, right? The badge is the symbol of the process of assessing for some competency. So, in a learning management system or learning environment, the infrastructure for creating and issuing badges is created by a badge uh, API, such as provided by Badger, and I'm showing Badger here on the screen, which in essence defines or describes the workflow for the process. Now, why did I pick Badger as my example, my go-to example through this entire uh, module? Well, because it's open source and because Badger basically assumed responsibility for the whole Mozilla Backpack project. But there is, you know, a general badge specification. Um, so it's not just Badger that's involved here. So there's a core process, um, a core workflow here. And I looked at it through the course in exquisite and excruciating detail. So first we need to create an issuer who's responsible for creating and awarding badges. Um, then after that, we need to create the badge itself and, and they call it a badge class because presumably uh, the badges are the individual tokens that you give out, right? So you have a class of badges. I would have just called it badge. And then if I had to be specific, you know, badge token or badge image or whatever, but okay. Um, creating a badge optionally in Badger uh, also includes defining the criteria for earning it. And, and typically that would refer to a web page of some sort. In our course, it referred back to the, the badge and then in turn to the task associated with the badge. So there we have, you know, we're adding the badge class. Here are the criteria for the badge class and the data involved in the badge class. Then next, and the fun part, 
we can award the badge. And that's called in Badger and elsewhere an assertion. Um, so basically we're asserting the conditions of the badge to the person based optionally on certain evidence. And then finally, and I didn't really address this a whole lot, uh, we display the badge in, in a CV or a backpack or something. So like I said, I explored this in exquisite, excruciating detail, getting right down to the finer process. Um, we don't need to worry about that. The, the main thing we need to worry about is the possibility of awarding a badge as the recognition of attaining some competency you know, in other words, achieving some kind of success in learning, which in this course I defined as completion of a task. So there you go. But badges could be a proxy for what could be a recognition entity of any sort. And just as an aside, I looked for the term recognition entity out there on the internet. Nothing. So maybe I'm using a new term here. If so, yay. Uh, if not, fine. Um, a recognition entity is a thing, an entity, that is used to signify recognition of something. Badges, certificates, awards are recognition entities. So are endorsing, endorsements, references, plaudits, etc. Sometimes things are taken to be recommendation entities and they're not. Retweets, for example. Uh, or citations or you know references to a person um, you know we might not be recognizing some achievement by them we just might be referring to them so we need to be careful here not to confuse recognition entity with reference um, software out there already is being used to make use of this uh, here in Canada, in fact, here at NRC, we have a project called Micromissions. And the whole idea of Micromissions is that we use profiles of individuals in order to associate them with short-term or part-time tasks. Um, you know, we have the needs of the task defined as perhaps a set of competencies and the recognized ability of the person and then we just match them together to recommend that this person could do this task. You know, assuming that the person wants to do this task. So recognition entities uh, are and will continue to be valued by some course participants. So the next generation of learning technologies will probably have some kind of mechanism for generating them. Um, in Grasshopper, I sort of think of this generation mechanism as a loose association of three key elements. And, and I use the term association here deliberately, right? I'm not talking about cause effect necessarily, although we can draw, you know, kind of a relation. You get one that leads to the other, etc. But I just want to think of it as association of these things. And so the three things are, first of all, modules. Uh, what a module is in my way of thinking, uh, you know, is, well, it's today's answer to a learning object, but basically it's a thing that describes the knowledge or skills intended to be captured by these recognition entities. Now, that's a pretty broad thing, and a module is itself a complex entity because, you know, the knowledge or skill um, is complex. It's not a single thing. Um, so a module might have different, well, it has different parts, different components. For example, a competency or a competency definition might be part of a module. Uh, a concept map of a domain might be part of a module. Uh, I have videos and uh, summary papers and contributions by participants. These are all part of a module because the knowledge of a specific subject isn't a bunch of statements, right? The knowledge is this complex, messy, networky kind of thing that we're trying to get a handle on. The second thing is tasks. And what a task does is it associates 
the performance required, and I'm construing that very broadly, in order to demonstrate comprehension or understanding or learning or knowledge, whatever, of the module. And the idea of a task is it produces an outcome that is an artifact or evidence of that comprehension. So on the one hand, we have the knowledge, we have then the thing that we do, and then the badge is the mechanism for bringing the association together. It associates the successful completion of a task in some module with some person. So uh, inside a course, like in eLearning 3.0, these three may be defined by the course designer, and, and I've done so in, in eLearning 3.0. But in an open and distributed network, it's allowed and indeed expected that modules, tasks, and badges would be developed by multiple participants. And that's why I had people in the course create their own badges. That's why I had people in the course create their own tasks. Because the idea here of learning a discipline is that it's not all about one person defining all of these things. It's rather all about the community defining these things by each person in the community creating modules or parts of modules or resources or tasks. And ultimately, in, the, in a future version of this course, I would have them define a competency. That would have been a pretty good exercise here. I didn't, but I could have, right? Um, you know, and it's... it's you know, it's the sort of thing that's been done before in other cases. We had our, our previous MOOCs where participants define the content of the course. We saw in DS106 by Jim Groom and others, the creation of the assignment bank. The assignment bank basically is a community uh, created set of tasks associated with the course. The only difference is I called it task instead of assignment. Um, because I prefer the more neutral terminology of the task. And of course, there's no reason why people couldn't create modules or parts of modules to help people create their own tasks or create their own badges, etc. So we kind of bring it out, right? We kind of explode it. Well, maybe explode's not the right word, but, uh, you know, we, we, we we make it so that uh, you know we're we're not dependent on the centralized institution or instructor to define the range of knowledge in a specific area. Now, how all this is going to be applied to the next generation of learning is, in my view, going to have a profound impact. First of all. As, as, as I've talked about before, the nature of knowledge and skills themselves are changing. And I, I've tried to capture that in the way I've designed this course and in previous MOOCs. And, you know, knowledge, uh, skills, course content, instead of being a set of documents or narration or story or, you know, logical narration, inference leading to a single conclusion, whatever, uh, this is gradually migrating to uh, a model based on decentralized linked data mod models. Um, and this model is constantly changing. The contents of this model are constantly changing. The links between the contents of the model are constantly changing. So a domain or discipline might be represented with a graph of associated concepts actions, activities, background assumptions, environments, and who knows what. And it doesn't make sense to depict knowledge as the discipline of remembering these data points. And neither does it make sense to think of assessment as uh, you know, determining whether you've remembered the data that you were presented in the course. In fact, the data is the least important part of the course. Because the data itself is always constantly changing. What really matters is your facility in working in this decentralized linked data model, which is where the tasks come in. And the key here is how these tasks and therefore competencies are defined. And 
There's a really good article, and unfortunately the author's name isn't on the article, and I don't know what the author's name is, so I can't credit him or her, but the article says, open badges can be highly effective in capturing learning and linking to new learning to changes in work practices. The key to this is the criteria you set and the expectations and guidance you give regarding the evidence you will require of the learner before awarding the badge. Now, that makes, or that leads us to a key point that in this kind of course, uh, with this understanding of assessment and recognition, the knowledge is in the doing itself, right? Uh, the knowledge is created by our performing the tasks and we're performing the tasks by working with, manipulating, creating new parts of this overall uh, linked data set that constitutes the dis discipline or domain in question. We associate tasks of elements of the data model, but it's the completion of the task itself that is learning, not the acquisition of the data model. And we need to be thinking, therefore, of these tasks more broadly. We need to be thinking of the content of assessments more broadly. You know, the traditional model based on tests and assignments, grades, degrees, certifications, etc., is going to be inadequate for this kind of wider conception. With XAPI activity data, we can begin tracking things. Uh, we can begin tracking what resources a person read, who they spoke to, what questions they asked, anything they do related to this course, which is to say anything they do related to this distributed web of interactive linked data, including the tasks, the people, the productions that they make, the posts that they create, etc. Now, ultimately, ultimately, we're going to use actual artificial intelligence based assessment of competent performance in order to create these competency models. Uh, and you know there there are good examples of this. I don't have a link to it, but uh, you know the automated assessment of grading, automated essay grading, for example, you take examples of already marked essays and you put them in piles A, B, C, D, E, and then you feed them to uh, a neural network program. And what the neural network does is it learns how to categorize essays into groups A, B, C, D, and, well, not E, but F. And that's how AI-based systems like uh, speech, speech raters or competency systems generally or professional evaluation, that's typically how they work. The danger here, and it's a significant and recognized danger, is that the automated system might begin to associate incidental characteristics with proficiency. For example, if we had an automated competency recognition system looking at doctors to, you know, look, looking at you know, uh, what, do, what constitutes a good doctor, well, the system among all the other information it would be fed, might uh, be fed the information that most doctors are male and most doctors are white. And therefore, implicitly, it, there will never be a statement saying this, but implicitly, it will tend to record whiteness and maleness as evidence of success in being a doctor. And of course, femaleness and, and non-whiteness is evidence of failure to be a doctor. Now, that's not the kind of result that we want uh, because we know through other means that being male or being white really has nothing to do with whether or not you're a successful doctor. Well, what does? Part of the answer is, I think, can a doctor do doctor-like tasks? Um, but now that means, you know, answering the question of what is a doctor-like task. And that's what 
competency definitions are trying to get at with the answer, right? They're trying to define, you know, they create knowledge, but really it's the test of this knowledge, the evidence of this knowledge that constitutes the knowledge that they're looking for. Um, we, we need actual authentic tasks designed by or contributed by humans that would perhaps balance the possibility of these bi biased algorithms, right? If we, if we tell the algorithm, look at the task, look at the performance and not the person, we begin to approach something like a more neutral, artificially intelligent uh, recognizer system of both what constitutes a competency and what qualifies as successful completion or, or demonstration of that competency. You know, and this is related to other aspects of learning. Um, there was a discussion in the uh, Random Access blog post about whether simulations can be useful in learning. And I made an offhand remark to Diplab vaccine, you know, uh, that they're expensive and hard to produce, which is true if we're talking about virtual reality. Um, but of course, uh, as was pointed out in the article, um, you know, you can create online simulations using only HTML video and audio, so you don't really need the whole infrastructure. Um, what really matters is the authenticity of the situations and learner tasks, how closely they resembled the reality of the job from the perspective of the person taking the simulation. And the author point uh, quoted uh, uh, Jan or Ian Harrington, uh, the use of authentic tasks encourage, encourages and supports immersion in self-directed and independent learning. And I think all of that is exactly right. So the learning is in the doing. Or as Wittgenstein would say, meaning is use. Uh, we also gather data from tasks and activities completed outside the school or program, looking at actual results and actual feedback from the workplace or the home or social media or wherever. Um, in, cor in corporate learning, for example, as described by uh, the Kirkpatrick levels, this is actually necessary and expected. So for example, you would have a 360 uh, review process, usually as a result of executive training if people in the lower ranks don't get this kind of attention. Um, but the idea here is that the review in the workplace would follow the learning experience so that we're actually evaluating the person's application and success in application of the learning in the workplace. Now, in the world of centralized data platforms, this becomes risky and intrusive. And of course, the data would never be kept secret, no matter how much they promised it would be kept secret, because we know anything you contribute to a website will eventually be hacked. It's just, if they can get your uh, credit card numbers, they can get your learning data. I think that's pretty, pretty straightforward to say. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that anyone would want all of their activities tracked by a single central entity. Um, you know, already Facebook does it and Google does it and it feels kind of creepy. But you know, this might be something we can't avoid. Um, insurance adjusters do this. Credit rating companies do this. Equifax, for example. Um, they will evaluate your credit, whether or not you want them to. And then they will get hacked and leak that data out to whomever. Uh, China's social credit system that has been in the news quite a bit recently uh, is again a case of a third party that examines your data, whether or not you want them to, and then makes decisions about your qualifications. And then your qualifications have real world impact on what you can do. People criticize China for this, but let's understand, it's not just China doing this. Every society, in every society, this is being done. It's just a question of which party is doing it. Is it, is it a credit agency 
uh, which will deny you a credit card and by that means prevent you from traveling or renting a car or staying in a hotel? Or do is it just skipping the middleman like the Chinese do and just apply that directly? In a distributed data model where people manage their own data, we have more opportunities. So there's no central repository. There's no way for third parties to actually mine this data uh, if this data belongs to us and stays with us. And while there's no doubt people continue to collect badges, degrees, certificates, etc., they'll play a smaller role. What will be more important is our data and the collection of our data and how we can gather that data, keep that data, control that data, and yet at the same time be able to validate that data. Um, so in the works now are interruptions from medium, uh, things like zero knowledge proofs and things like that so that we can store our data in an encrypted form in a distributed blockchain network say so that a third party to whom we present the data can know that the data is reliable even if they don't know the personal information about the person the data describes. This is the kind of stuff that's in development now and this is the kind of stuff that's going to form the basis for recognition in the future. An individual can but should not be required to display their learning accomplishment. They can do it through badges, resumes, portfolios, etc. But the trust in these learning records, which is today granted by expensive intermediaries like universities with credentials and transcripts and all of that, will in the future be provided through trustworthy decentralized network technologies where the network technology itself creates the trust, creates the reliability in the record rather than the institution. Uh, and, the, and the one immediate benefit of that is going to be uh, the end of untrustworthy institutions advancing candidates which really should not be considered to be qualified in a discipline. So, uh, one example of this is to encode recognition data, such as a badge, in a blockchain. And that was my ambition at the beginning of this module, was to do that. And I kind of bogged down in the technology. But, you know, I've got some blockchain code kicking around the grasshopper, and I've pretty much worked through all the API stuff for badgers, so I can create and issue badges now. So, in the next week, the plan is to take this badge data, the awarding of badges to individuals, and to encode this, encode, encode this into a blockchain created by Grasshopper. Ultimately, I'd want to create it and store it in a wider blockchain network, but you know, one thing at a time. And then this allows us to talk more about the process created to or the, you know, the process around the creation of these records, how these records are accessed, how these records are assessed, what kinds of technologies are used. The really interesting stuff that will form the basis for what we call recognition in future learning, in what I'm calling eLearning 3.0. But what we've seen so far represents really a signal change in how we've regarded learning previously. Uh, previously, we've been very focused on process. We've been very focused on centralized institutions that are in themselves go through an accreditation process, through course materials and learning environments that themselves go through an accreditation process, all the way through to individual learners that themselves go through a centralized accreditation process and we're looking at making these processes self-evident and self-trustworthy and available for analysis from a wide variety of perspectives. 
That's why I say in the future, you know, the evidence of success in learning won't be a degree or a badge or a certificate. It will be a job offer. And it might not even be a job in the form of a career. It might be a job offer in the form of a short-term contract or whatever. And we already see this today. We, we see evidence of this today in the many types of job offers that people are offered from sponsorships, to speaking opportunities, to short-term contracts, to uh, you know Patreon payments, to you know, there's a whole range of ways that people are recognizing in concrete uh, form uh, the achievements of individuals in a community-based decentralized way. And so the story of recognition is going to be how does this all begin to come together? How does this assemble as, uh, well, I, I don't want to say a single system because it's not a single system, but how does it all assemble as a consistent set of network protocols and entities and, 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 and variables within that system? And, and I think that's far more interesting a question to be looking at than, uh, you know, does some learning technology produce an increased outcome on some standardized test? And indeed, you know, when I look at it, those kind of questions seem not only irrelevant and archaic, but actually damaging and restrict our understanding and our progress uh, toward what ought to be a more equitable and accessible education system generally. Because you know these assessment and recognition systems currently create a huge bottleneck and really what we want to do is to be able to go from uh, performance of a task to recognition of the performance of that task without all of the intermediary, without all the overhead and the structure and the cost and the expense and the barriers. So that's it for recognition for now. Uh, the next edition of this course, and there will be a next edition of this course, I'm going to come back to this again and look at where we've gotten to and I'm going to take a lot of the discussion that we've done here as given and then try to look at what the next steps are. But, you know, that's down the road a ways. So for now, I'm Stephen Downs. Thanks for watching and listening. Sorry about the talking head. I tried to make it interesting, but, you know, I mean, sometimes the talking head's the best way to go about this stuff. Bye for now.